people buy on emotion and justify with logic. That's the first thing. So people will make a buying decision often in a heartbeat. And you know, I'm sure you guys, if when you've met a client, uh, you've got some, you walk in the door and you go, yeah. <laughs> and then you've got other ones, you walk in the door and you go, yeah, I know. Episode 108. This is the business of architecture. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where each week I speak with a successful architect, designer, or consultant to discuss tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. When you speak to the folks over at BQE Software, please mention this show. Because when you use ArchiOffice, you support Business of Architecture, which allows me to continue bringing you this content. Today, we're talking with Frank Aldridge. Frank is an expert in the field of negotiating and helping companies win bids. He's also an expert in project management. He has a, a fascinating backstory. We're going to talk to him a little bit about that, but I'm excited to bring him on the show today because a lot of the work that he does as a consultant, he's not an architect, but he is a consultant, uh, relates directly to what architects do. And he's going to share with us some tips and strategies for winning bids and tenders that you might not have heard of before. He's developed a very cool process to be able to um, start relationships with large entities and land large contracts. That's one of the things he does for a living. So I'm excited to get him on here. He's going to tell us a little bit about an experience. For, he's going to tell us about a story where he used uh, a $2,000 consultation to lot, land a, a contract for $100,000 uh, billable. So got a lot of good information and really excited to have him on the show because he is just a brilliant, brilliant person, uh, fun to be around and really look forward to our conversation. So Frank, welcome to Business of Architecture. Yeah, thanks, Enoch. Frank, first of all, you are from New Zealand, and it's fun to get another New Zealander on the show. You'll be the third, so you guys are representing pretty strongly. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, New Zealanders always punch above their weight, so yeah. That's what I uh, hear. That's what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> so, Frank, give us a little... Um, what Let's talk about, obviously, there's a, a lot of directions we could take our interview here that would be interesting to the listeners of the show. You know, we could talk about product management. We could talk about uh, winning winning bids and being competitive in that space. Uh, we could talk about negotiation. I'd really like to touch on all of those. But first, let us know a little bit about you and how you came to have such a varied background here in these different areas. <clears throat> yeah, well, it's interesting where, where I'm sitting. I'm at home today and I'm sitting um, about uh, 400 yards from where I had my first job. So uh, my first job was a shepherd. So... Um, I don't know if you even have those in the States, but uh, uh, we do. Yeah, shepherd, sheep shearer, bulldozer driver, scrub cutter. Um, somewhere in the middle of that, I got a maths degree. And uh, um, and then coming out of university, I worked for a government department. So I was the Ministry of Energy. I had a couple of years there. And then, and then I got into the real world, and that was I had five years with Shell. So, uh, um, so with Shell, I was a commercial. Uh, I worked in their planning area and then I was a commercial rep where I was actually out on the road. And that's where I started to get some real commercial background negotiating small contracts. And then, you know, uh, they probably weren't very big, but there were lots of them. And so it gave me a good grounding in that. Um, then I was a distribution manager for Shell. And then I left there and went and worked for Transpower. So in New Zealand, Transpower is the national grid operator for the electricity system. So I was their contract negotiator. So I had three years there and Basically, all I did every day of the week was negotiate contracts and had some very good training in amongst that um, and, you know, just got lots and lots of experience in negotiating contracts. So uh, it was 18 years ago, I went out on my own as a consultant and uh, one of the first people that approached me was a big company in New Zealand. They they thought they needed a negotiator, but in actual fact, they needed a procurement uh, expert in process. So procurement is really that whole process of um, looking at how a company buys stuff, going to the market, you know, going through some sort of tender process, selecting a supplier. And, and so um, I didn't really know how to do that, but I bought a book on it and read one chapter, hit everyone else and saved them $10 million. So 
that sort of really got my business started. So, so those are really so the t- spaces. Tell me, we... tell me that again. Could you sell again? You've read, <laughs> you've read the book. What? <laughs> yeah, I read a book and then I just sort of read one chapter ahead of everyone else and I'd read something and I'd go, gee, that sounds like a good idea. And I'd go and do it the next day. And it was a book called How to Double Your Profit in Six Months or Less. It was written by an American. And, and I'd just go out and try that the next day. And if it worked, we saved the money and, uh, and I got a share of it. And so we saved them $10 million. So that sort of got me started. And so really from negotiating then procurement, we got into project management. The, the three topics all go very much in hand. Uh, but what we also did was because I've now run over 100 sort of tenders and, and um, that sort of process, we saw what clients did well and what they didn't do well and when they were responding to these things. And so we could then, um, we started doing some training on how to win tenders. And we've now helped, uh, as recent as two days ago, 42 clients respond to um, tenders and, and bids and that sort of thing. So we work in that space too. But through all that, you know, what we found one of the best ways to get businesses do training in this space. And so we do training in all of those. And and that's where this sort of some of these techniques have come from. I had to learn things around the training. And then the clients, whenever they'd get a problem, they'd, gee, who was that guy that trained us? Oh, that's right. Yeah. So he must be an expert and they'd get us in to fix it. So, so a lot of what I'll talk to you about today is things we've worked out how to fix them. Perfect. So you do training in the areas of negotiation, product management, procurement? Yep, and, and winning tenders. Winning, and winning. so, yeah, and we, we even did a little uh, workshop last week and um, we got 20, 21 uh, people from different companies come to that on, on how to win tenders with the government. And it was only two and a half hours long, but we've already picked up clients out of that. And it's just another way of bringing in business. Um, over 35% of our clients have come from a training workshop somewhere. Excellent. I love it. Uh, for our listeners who aren't familiar with the term tender, uh, we call that bid, uh, bidding process. Yep. So, Frank, let's let's talk a little bit about negotiation because a lot of times, you know, a lot of times there is a little bit of negotiation involved in architectural contracts. And if we were just to talk for a minute about some of the intricacies in the psychology behind negotiation that a smaller firm, so let's talk about these would be smaller contracts. These would be maybe working with homeowners, business owners, um, small entities like school districts, et cetera. Yeah, sure. Um, it's, it's interesting you picked up the word psychology because the the first slide in, in pretty well all of my training workshops is about psychology. And it's the bit that no one else um, uh, sort of focuses on when they're training in these areas. So that we think we're quite unique in that respect. Um, and a lot of where I picked this up, uh, stuff up was, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of spin selling. Yeah, by Neil Rackman. Yep, yep. Sure. So somehow somehow um, I got a tape by Neil Rackham and uh, and it was about the psychology of negotiating. And so I, I ended up burning the thing out. It broke it. Um, but the big part of that was about understanding the psychology. And mm. so I guess when I'm training on this, the first things are, um, are that people buy on emotion and justify with logic. That's the first thing. So people will make a buying decision often in a heartbeat. And you know, I'm sure you guys have, when you've met a client, uh, you've got some, you walk in the door and you go, yeah. <laughs> and then you've got other ones, you walk in the door and you go, yeah, I know. Mm. <laughs> and that that little emotional decision happens in about half a second. They'll, they'll then go through quite a long, drawn out uh, process of logic to justify that decision and go, yes, we'll work with you or no, we won't. And so there's an element of learning how to get on with people that's important there. But um the, the next thing is that um, we, we've got another phrase we talk about and that's and it relates to corporate clients but it also relates to in, individuals and that's it's out of a out of a book um, and the book's called it's not how good you are it's how good you want to be and this this phrase says uh, clients are corporate people protecting their own mortgages and so the next line is, actually says is therefore they see your innovative idea as a threat rather than an advancement to their career. And so when you're dealing with corporate clients, often what they want is safe, they want proven, they want um, that you you can demonstrate you know what you're doing. And so if you know those two things, then um, it starts to sort of help you, you know, how, how you approach clients. 
And and the third part of that story is actually spin. You know, that's um, the Neil Rackham spin selling. And so spin stands for the types of questions you ask in a sales situation. And so the first one is situational, the next one's problem, then it's implication, and then out of that comes a need. And what they found was um, the more implication questions you ask, the the greater chance you've got of selling. Because if someone's got a problem, that's good, that motivates them. But if you bore into the implication, that's what the bit with the emotion in it. So if you link those three ideas together, the top one was people buy on emotion and justify with logic. This is where you link emotion and selling together because you bring in uh, that implication. So how I do that in a selling sense is when I'm talking with clients or maybe I've done some initial discussions with clients and they want my thoughts, I'll say, well, here's the, here's the three issues you've got. But rather than, because I've got a maths degree and I'm a bloke, all right, so I'm, I'm a man, so I go, all right, you give me a problem, I'm going to solve it. <laughs> what I found in selling was that didn't work. So, because uh, it, it just went straight over their head. So what I had to do was bring in the bit in the middle and that was the uh, the impact or the implication because that had the emotion in it. So you could then say, all right, here's the issue, but here's the, here's the impact of that issue. This is the bit with the pain in it. And then here's how you solve it. So an example was I was doing some work with a bank and um, I was doing a procurement review, so looking at how they procure all their stuff. And part of that, and it was about number four on the list, was they had no contract register. It's no big mm-hmm. deal, right? So I'm presenting to the chief executive and he's looking, oh, yeah, that's really boring. And then I said to him, you know, what that means is when Standard & Poor's do an interview with you and do a, a credit rating review and they find that out, it means you've got no security supply. That's one of the things they look for. And what that means is you'll get a critic downgrade rating. Now I've really got his attention, right? Mm -hmm. Then I go Mm -hmm. for the juggler. I said, you imagine explaining to your board that you got a critic downgrade rating because you didn't do some simple procedural thing. So then he goes, oh, wow, what do we do to fix it? You know, and so now I've got him and and we're in. So a lot of the psychology is really important. And to answer your original question, how does that work in negotiating? Uh, The biggest thing in negotiating, and and Neil Neil Rackham taught me this, is, is that you've got to ask questions. So if you are trying to lead them to a direction, you've got to ask them questions to get them there because that way they go there on their own. If you start telling them stuff or telling them they're wrong, the barriers will go up, they'll paint themselves into a corner and they won't move. And so that's the biggest advice I can give on on uh, the psychology of negotiating. And the biggest advice on the practical side is you've just got to do a simple little bit of preparation before you negotiate. And do you and have, do you have a, we, a story or an example you could tell us that would illustrate that principle? Uh, which one, the, the preparation or the or the psychology? The psychology, the implication. Yeah, I think that one with the bank is a classic example of that because what was happening when I was uh, I was at a point where I was early in my career and and I'd go and meet with clients and they'd they'd have a problem and I could see the answer straight away and if I just told them the answer. Mm. They just didn't engage. They didn't buy. And the reason for that was um, they hadn't emotionalized it. Mm. And so um, another example was, and often you've got to go on for the negative because people will do 80% more to avoid pain than they will to gain pleasure. But when I was working for Shell, one of the things I was selling was a fuel card. And it was in the early days of fuel card. So I'd go into a trucking company and I'd say to them, hey, you know, if you signed up on this card, we can save you four cents a litre. And they go, yeah, that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopee. But then I could say, and, and this was 20 years ago, you know, but I'd, I could say, well, you know, four cents a litre, that's worth on your volume, that's worth about $5,000 a year. You know, you could take the family on a vacation to the, you know, the theme parks and stuff. You know, we would talk about Australia, but um, for that sort of money. And they'd go, Oh wow! Now that's that's worth doing, and all I've got to do is get this card. Yeah. All oh, right. So that's linking, uh, you know, the emotion into a buying decision, um, and making it worth their while. But if you just go problem solution, people don't get it and they don't buy in, and it's partly because they're just getting bombarded with so much information. Mm. You know, they they have all these filters and and blocks up to stop it, and. So to get through the filters and blocks, you've got to have some emotion in what you're selling. Gotcha. Uh, in terms of the preparation, do you have any examples yeah. there that you can give us? What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, boy, you're getting negotiating 101 today. Um, 
So when I first went out on my own, um, I was negotiating contracts. That's what I did. And they were mostly electricity contracts. So, you know, if you've ever got insomnia, um, a great cure for that is reading electricity contracts. They're as boring as anything. But <laughs> um, then this client approached me and they wanted, um, they thought they needed a negotiator, but in actual fact, they needed a procurement process. So they were a large company in New Zealand. They were all over New Zealand, um, but they were in deep financial trouble at the time. And so, I had some initial meetings with them and then what they didn't know was at that time I only had three days work left. So from a psychological point of view, what I had to do was sit in my car for half an hour going, they need me, I don't need them. All right, just over and over and over. So when I walked in the door, you know, I came in looking like John Wayne. Um, <laughs> they, they, they saw this guy, I had gun smoke coming out my nostrils um, and yet, you know, I never said anything. They just got it, you know, and that's that that instant buying on emotion and a thing that goes on that, you know, when you walk in and see the client. Um, so they got it. But the other thing I'd done was just written up a little table and it just had, uh, because we'd had one little discussion, so we knew where the deal was going and they were offering me to do this piece of work, $100,000 and $100,000 bonus if I pulled it off. So that was quite attractive for someone who only had three days work in, in, the, in the pipeline. But, the other thing was they were they were engaging me to be a negotiator, so I thought I'd better show them how to do it. And so all I did was a little table, and it had three columns: uh, bottom line, expected, and I called the other one "yeehaw," you know. <laughs> and uh, and then going down, it, we started talking about what about I do this on a share of the savings. So I had a retainer, and I'd, I'd written bottom line. Well, they were already offering me a hundred thousand dollars, so that's the bottom line is a hundred thousand dollars. Um, and then 120 and 150 were my expected and, and yeehaw. Then in the percentages, I had two, three, and five, and I'd worked those out. Five was worth, you know, um, it was worth over $100,000. So I'd done that. Here's the key. You've got to do this little bit of analysis when you're on your own and you're thinking well and you're cool, calm, and collected. There's no point trying to do this stuff when you're in the thick of it. And then I had some other little bits and pieces like I needed a car park and I needed various other things. So they were all in there. So when we walked in for the second discussion, I come in again looking like John Wayne. And so the next trick is who goes first? Well, they always go first, right? You always get them to go first. And so there's a phrase I've got for that. And I've been told off for saying this, but it's, you know, show us your knickers or show us your underpants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like, if you show me yours, I'll show you mine. And, um, I've done some training in councils here and I got told off because they're, you know, they get offended by that sort of talk. But um, so, uh, so Rotto, they go first. And, and so he comes up with now, remember the original offer was $100,000 and 100000 bonus. We're now talking percentages. So he comes out with 120000 and 10%. Now I've done the numbers 10% is worth um, close to $300,000. So this has now gone from a $200,000 deal to a $400,000 deal. So this is now getting exciting. All right, yeah. we're getting excited here. <laughs> so, so the next thing you've got to know, you're really getting the goods here. Um, negotiating 101 is what's the answer to that? What do you say? And there's a standard answer that you say every time. Do you want to know it? <laughs> we would love to, that's, sure. Yeah, that's a good start. That's a good start. And mm. you say it with a nice big smile on your face because what that tells them is two things. It says... One is um, we're on the table. We're going to get a deal here today. But the other is, but there's more to come. All right. So you've now, you've made a friend and, but you're telling them there's a bit more to come yet. So the two keys there, get them to go first, whatever they come back with, that's a good start. And because I had the table sitting in front of me, and I don't know if you remember the numbers, but the first column had, the first row had 100, 120 and 150. And the second row had two, three, and five percent. Well, he's offered me ten. So inside, my heart's doing absolute somersaults because I know that this is worth, you know, twice what I was thinking. But hell, we're on a roll here. So armed with my table, I could then say, well, hell, you know, if you made that one hundred and fifty, I think we've got a deal. So I just hung it out there for him to jump at, and he jumped, uh -huh. and he and he grabbed it. And the thing was, is if I hadn't hit the table in front of me, I'd have gone. Wow, that's awesome! I'll have it. 
But because I've done that little bit of prep, I know what it's worth. I've now got that and I say, oh, that's a good start. I'll tell you what, if you made that 150, I think we've got a deal. So that little table got me 30,000. Now the thing was that contract went for four years. All right, so that was 30,000 a year for four years by having the table in front of me. Mm, mm. Is that worth it? Well, I thought so, but you know, <laughs> yeah. So it's the, the prep and it's understanding that psychology. That's what negotiating is all about. Fascinating. So, mm. so how does that tie into, let's jump over really quickly to project management. Yep. So um, because we're, Go in and do training, and um, and I guess I, I I managed to get a niche. You know, uh, uh, Richard Petrie, who you all know and trust, is is one of my coaches, and and um, so he's got a strong niche in architecture. He knows a whole lot about it. Um, I started to develop a niche with council, so they're the you know uh, I'm not sure what you call them in in, in the states, but um, so we started creating this niche, and so I'd go in and do project management training for them, and then they'd get a problem. So, you know, the first person they call is the expert. And so I'd go in and we've we've got another technique, which I'm not going to teach you today. That's for another day. But the first thing I want to know is, hey, what's going on here? So I'd bring in the people who are managing the project and and everyone else. So in a in a in a council or a company or a corporate, that's typically people from might be the IT department, the property department, the the finance department, all those sort of things. And so I'd get them all in, sometimes one-on-one, sometimes all together with the project team and say, all right, what's going on here? What do you know about this project? What don't you know about it? What could trip us up? So we did one of these for a council. They were building a new um, a new civic building, a new set of offices. And uh, so it was about a, I think it was a $10 million project and they were getting close to the end, but uh, the project manager had been a bit loose and we did this little workshop and there was 146 action points came out of it and I was like whoa (laughs) 146 balls about to be dropped and so this sort of kept happening everywhere I was going so you know I sat back and thought it wasn't the logical answer why don't we do this at the start (laughs) and and so, well, why don't people do these things at the start? You know, why don't they have a meeting and bring in these people? Well, the, the answer is always, oh, we're too busy. You know, we haven't got time. You know, why don't people plan? Oh, we haven't got time. So what I had to do is I had to make it fast. And, you know, this stuff's pretty boring, so I had to make it fun. And and then we then we found the, the magic ingredient. Um, if you want to keep get people to come to these things, you throw in some food and they all turn up, you know. So, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> you know, we were doing a big project with a client and it, one part of it, we needed people to help and no one would come. At the end of the project, it was so successful, they had a, you know, a, a sort of a, a morning coffee and and muffins and, and 80 people turned up and the client said to me, you know, hey, so if you see anything, yeah, great job, Frank, and anything you want to say? And I said, yeah, I wish we'd had the morning tea first. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they, they would have come. So fun, fast food and um, and the other thing is just make it first, do it first. And so it's make it fast and that. But so, so what I had to do was think of a way of doing this that was fast. And the thing was, I'd been teaching some of these techniques in my training workshops. And in order to teach them, I had to think up quick ways of doing it so I could do it in a short space of time. And I thought the logical answer, you know, sometimes you have these flashes of brilliance. And it's like, oh, hell, why don't I just do in the real world, world what I'm doing in the training? So I built up this little workshop. And I guess it's evolved over, you know, five or six years, but more recently in about the last year, it's it, I've got much, much better at it. And so, so, um, so then I'd, you know, so all right, um, we've now got a little workshop we can do to get the project off on the right foot. But the other, the other element of it, Enoch, is that um, as a consultant or as an architect, it's often really hard to just come in and pick up a client from cold you know if you've never dealt with them before um they don't want to spend a whole lot of money with you when they don't know you they don't necessarily trust you they can deal with things you're promising and so i got taught a, a thing it was called the pathway to the client and the first step is some free added value stuff it might be um uh it might be um 
you know, a report or 10 tips to save money or whatever. But the next thing is an easy entry product. So uh, in our work, one example of this, I'll do a webinar for training people. It's $100. So I've just done one of these where I had a guy come on for $100. He attended the webinar. Then we did a, a training workshop. It was $1,000. He sent one of his staff to that, project management. Uh, she came to that. She went back saying how great it was. He came and visited me last week. They're now getting me in to do an in-house training workshop. That's $8,000. And he wants consulting. So that's where the real money will come. But without selling to him, I've turned that from $100 to $1,000 to $8,000. So from a consulting point of view, what can I do? Well, suddenly it dawned on me that, hell, this Right Track workshop is a great easy entry product. So I could say to the client, we could be discussing things that have met me from somewhere or whatever, and that's would uh, yeah, okay, um, this is what we're doing. I said, well, look, if you've got a little example, I could just come and do one for you, show you how it works. Um, I could do this right track workshop, and this is how it all works, and, and it's $1,000. And so that allows me an hour to prep for it, two hours to deliver it, and an hour to write it up, and I'm, so I'm, I'm sort of averaging about $250 an hour, but they're getting a, the start of a problem solved, the start of a project done, um, and get to know me, and they're paying me for it. So that means my cost of sales is is virtually zero. Um, they're now paying me to come and advertise to them. And so that's where this is really powerful. So, um, And I've got countless ones we've done that to, even as recent as last week we locked in one. So we'd done... This is for the inland revenue in New Zealand. We're, we're now working for them. Yeah. So I'm going to get some tax money back. So we mm. we have have sold them on doing um, a right track workshop for their senior leadership team of the, the procurement area. So this is a very big part of inland revenue. They spend uh, billions of dollars and they do it really badly. So we're now going to do a right track workshop for them, show them how to do this. But out of that, they've already now booked the $8,000 training workshop. So we got them on board and we haven't even delivered it. We got them on board with the right track workshop. Now they're buying the $8,000 thing. What we really want is the uh, potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of consulting work that'll come out of the other end. So someone like a, an architect, very similar sort of thing. Um, you go and meet with someone that might be a, a corporate client, it might be a, a family, but they're still sorting you out. So we go back to people buy on emotion just by the logic, so they've got to like you. Then we go back to uh, corporate clients of people protecting their own mortgages. So this is a, a nice little safe entry area for a corporate client. Um, they get to see you prove that you can do it and you get to build up the relationship for a low, low amount of money. So um, the other thing is it sorts out whether they're serious or not. You know, we've had and I guess, you know, you architects, I bet, have had plenty where you've gone and, yeah, they're all serious and then, right, start fronting up with some money and now they're, oh, yeah, yeah, that's different. So this sorts out whether they're serious to part with some money because I only have five criteria for a client. One is they've got to like them. Two is they've got to be serious. Three is they've got to have money. Four, they've got to be prepared to part with it. And five, they've got to have integrity. So this sorts that out really quickly too. Mm. And so... um the, the example that Enik talked about earlier on was um, I'm running a procurement process. So it's a project and procurement for a council at the moment. But initially they rang me up and said, look, we've heard you can do this stuff. Uh, can you come and have a talk to us about it? And I said, well, yeah, that'd be great. But I think what we probably need to do is let's I'll show you how I would start this project with a right track workshop. And, you know, you can pay me $2,000 for doing that. So I'll come up, spend a couple of hours with them, ran the right track workshop um, because they were still deciding do they want to do the project or not. And so I took them through what this project would look like, did the right track workshop with them, and then um, charged them $2,000 for that. So they went away and had to think about it and they were still deciding do they want to go you know, this direction. So I got them to go and talk to one of my clients and that sold them. They actually spent a day there. And uh, so that sold them on the direction. But because they now trusted me, they then engaged me, and that, that's $100,000 worth of work. 
And um, but interestingly enough, the first thing I did on that project was I did another right track workshop. Did it all again, but we involved some different people. And then further down the track, we did a, a part of a right track workshop with another group of people from the client. And then on Monday, I'm going back up there because we've now uh, run through a, a bid process. We've selected a roading contractor. They're going to enter into a sort of an, an agreement with these guys. And we've now got to start implementing and putting the contract together. So I'm doing that on Monday and we're going to do another right track workshop at the start of that because there's new people involved and it'll get them all working together. So um, do they always go from the, the right track workshop to project work? No. Um, but what it means is I got paid, you know, a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars for them deciding did they want to go ahead and rather than me going doing a whole lot of work and getting paid nothing for it. And and in your world and in my world, if if you're getting paid by the hour or whatever, if you go and spend five hours with a client doing all those discussions or even two hours, even if you go and spend two hours with them and they don't go ahead, you, or even if they do go ahead, you've now actually got to do about your first six hours to pay for the two hours. So in essence, you've sort of now done about eight hours work for nothing. So what I do is I just have a, about a one hour meeting with them at the most. They either engage or they don't. And then if they do, they're now paying me for all of that pre-sales. Out of that, I can even do my project here's the next steps for your project in that workshop. So they're paying me to do the planning. So it means your cost of sales comes back to almost zero. So it's much more effective. And Frank, how is this related, this right track workshop process, which is brilliant, and we're going to dive into that yep. a little bit more. How is it related yep. to what you do helping people win bids? Can we touch on that for a little bit? Because that's, as architects, especially uh, institutional or, or larger clients, we're always out there um, submitting bids and competing in that landscape. We're submitting, you know, we do, we, we respond to requests for proposals. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I guess if you come back again, uh, the biggest thing uh, that I train on on uh, on winning bids is those three things again, the same things. People buy on emotion and justify with logic. Uh, clients are corporate people protecting their own mortgages. And then the spin part. So you've got to make statements that show them the emotion and show them the impacts of what's going on. Um, and the other biggest thing when you're responding to bids is when you're talking about um, the things you do and the um, the benefits of that is what does it mean to them? You know, if you've got to explain what it means to them. If you say, you know, something like, oh, I've been in business for 20 years, it's like, well, so what? You know, what does that mean to them? You've just done one year badly for 20 years? No, no, what it means to them. So, and what this means to you is we've built up a track record with a whole lot of clients who keep coming back and using us because they trust us and we've done a good job for them and they're happy with our services. You know, that that's much more powerful than just saying, you know, we've been in business for 20 years. You've got to bring it back to what it means to them. And again, you've got to always be focusing on we're safe. Um, you know, you use us and you'll be okay. Um, architects, classic example. I've done some work in New Zealand with architects uh, for the Ministry of Education. So that's the education department where we – put in place uh, panels of architects. They're supposed to be project managers, but they were all architects because that's a lot of what you guys do. Um, so that they could just go and select one off the panel and go and use it for you know building their school. Um, but the big thing they're looking for is safe, you know what you're doing and all that sort of thing. So you just got to keep bringing those messages back to if we were going to implement a project with you, this is – this is how we do our implementation. Here's the checklist we'd do. We we would start that with a right track workshop. So I've now got about oh, five or six clients who have put in their, in their bids that they will use a right track workshop to start the project off. So that's answering part of your question there, Enoch. This is where I bring right track into winning bids because what this does is it means you get the project off to a good solid uh, start. You get all the stakeholders buying in from the outset. That means you're less likely to drop the ball and it means you're much more likely that your project will be much more successful. 
and and this is sort of how we go about it and this is what comes out of it you know um so we we're, we're now using those with clients in their bids and we even call it the right track workshop in their bids and and the beauty is who they're going to get to come in and do that for them it'll be me you know I'll come in and run that right track workshop for their for their client and so we we're, we're getting uh, not only if we help them win their bid we we're, we're getting work out of them and winning their bid as well And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.